Well, let's begin by reading the concluding verses of Romans 16. Again, greetings uh, from those with Paul to the church at Rome. And remember, Paul is in Corinth, so these people he mentions here are with him in Corinth. And then he closes with a doxology. And that, uh, and we're probably going to wait this half and half, but I think um, both, there's points from both of these sections that I think will be helpful to us. So let's read it. Verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker greets you, and so do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you, and Quartus, the brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested or revealed. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Be the glory forever. Amen. So what is the proper response to everything that's in the book of uh, Romans that Paul has written? It is giving glory to God. Well, may the Lord bless this part of his word to our um, understanding, our growth in grace this morning, our growth into the likeness of Christ. Now, just by way of review, again, so far we've seen in chapter 16, Paul send his greetings, okay, to those that he knew that were in Rome. Now, we understand that Paul had not yet been there, okay? He wanted to go there. He was expressing his desire to go there so that he might minister to them and help them, but also to be helped by them as he was on his way to evangelize the Western Mediterranean. You know, he had already single-handedly, well, not single-handedly, but certainly he was the leading force the Lord used him to bring the gospel to the eastern part of the Mediterranean, but now he wanted to go to the western part, and he was hoping he could be helped by the church in Rome. Uh, but even though Paul hadn't been there, there were some he knew who were there and who had used their gifts to strengthen that church, uh, not the least of which, as we saw last time, was uh, Priscilla and Aquila. And he commended them for their hard work, all of these saints, because he knew that that is how the church is built. You know, without efforts, there's not going to be any fruit. If you don't sow any seed in the field, there's not going to be a crop. The same thing is true in the Christian life. If, if God's people don't put out efforts, there isn't going to be anything that's going to be accomplished. God doesn't work apart from his people. And so Paul was very thankful for the work that they were doing. And let's not forget the work they were doing is doxology, okay? It is praise. It is serving him, worshiping him through their service. And so he expressed his thanks for that. And then he warned them against their enemy, the devil, and the strategy that he would use to try to bring them down, division through false teachers. And by the way, those false teachers don't have to be outside of us. They can also be in us. Our flesh is probably the best false teacher, always convincing us of things that, that are wrong. But Paul, uh, well, we saw last week some examples of how Satan did this uh, to the churches in Galatia. Remember, he sent false teachers to them, the Judaizers who were teaching them that they needed to be circumcised and basically become Jews and observe the law of Moses besides trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was not enough. Satan was seeking to destroy them dividing the church through false teachers, and he did the same thing to John's audience. And that's what John, John was addressing, what's known as proto-Gnosticism in his letters. The idea that Jesus could not be a man, so he just appeared to be flesh. He was really spirit, a phantom, walking the earth. And John says to that, if you don't believe Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you can't be saved. Okay. And those who say he hasn't, 
they're the Antichrist. Okay. So false teaching, we have to watch out for it. Satan uses it, but he also uses it to divide churches. And then Paul not only warned them and us, but he also told us how to overcome this particular strategy of the evil one. First of all, we need to keep our eyes open for these people who would bring false teaching. We need to avoid them when we see them, not fall in line with them. We need to know God's Word more intimately so we can recognize them, you know, when, when they pop up, and they will, okay? And, of course, we need to be practicing His Word so that we'll be strong against Satan's attacks. We really don't understand what His Word means until we can apply it. So we need to strive for that application so we'll know it, so we can recognize them, so we can avoid them, and repel them when they come. Now, if they did this, Paul said, if we do this, not only would Satan fail to gain a foothold, but he would literally be crushed under their feet, under our feet. It's kind of an awesome thing, isn't it? Satan will be defeated. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, we are told by James and by Peter. Now, this morning, as I've said, Paul comes to the end of his letter, and he closes it first by allowing those who are with him to send their greetings, and secondly, by giving glory to God for everything that he has shared with them in this letter. And let's not forget, everything he has said in this letter applies to us if we are trusting in Jesus. How, how, can, we, <laughs> yeah, how can we respond to, to these things if we truly believe that they're real, you know, that we were on our way to a crisis eternity, but God in His mercy chose us to save us. How can we respond to that, to being now a part of the new heavens and the new earth forever? Well, again, all we can do is give our lives to Him in worship and in praise, and that's what we're going to see. So first of all, we see the greetings of those in Corinth to the church at Rome. We read in verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. Now, I'm sure that Timothy doesn't need any introduction. Uh, Timothy was Paul's true child in the faith. He was, we, you know, I think most commentators believe Timothy was converted by Paul's preaching when he first preached in Lystra on his first missionary journey. By the time of his second journey, two or three years later, Timothy had already grown to the point where Paul wanted to take him onto the mission field with him. And Timothy became one of his closest co-workers in the Lord. Do you know that Timothy is mentioned in 10 of Paul's letters? Now, Timothy was with Paul in Corinth, and he's sending his greetings to those who are in Rome. And really, he's probably the one of all of these that we know the most about. But let's mention some of these others. Lucius, Lucius, who's Lucius? Okay, well, Lucius was likely Lucius of Cyrene that we read about in Acts 13, who was one of the prophets in Antioch who ministered alongside of Paul. He was with him in Corinth. Shouldn't be surprising. Antioch was the center of Gentile Christianity. Those who were ministering there went to strengthen the different churches. This Jason is likely the one who hosted Paul in Thessalonica. Remember, he was in Thessalonica before he went to Corinth. And Jason followed him to Corinth. Sosipater is one of the delegates who accompanied Paul when he took that collection that was gathered from Macedonia and Achaia, the churches there, to Jerusalem. Now, Tertius, now here's an interesting character. Um, I, Tertius who, who, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now, I don't know if, you know, if you can think back to the first time you read the book of Romans and you reach this, this verse and you, want, you think about this, wait a minute, I thought Paul was the one who wrote this letter, but Tertius, who's that? He says, I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. And, and this can be kind of confusing. Who wrote the letter, Tertius or did Paul write it? Well, the fact is they both did, didn't they? Because Tertius was Paul's amanuensis. And that's a fancy word for secretary. He was the one who wrote it at Paul's dictation. And that's how, that's how Paul often wrote his letters. He didn't do it with his own hand. But we do find that Paul often added his signature 
to the letter to make sure that those who received it knew it was from him. Here's a couple of examples. We read in Colossians 4.18, this is how Paul closes that letter, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment, grace be with you. And then 2 Thessalonians 17 and 18, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write, okay? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, when he said, this is the way I write, he didn't mean by that the letter that I've written. You recognize my train of thought and how I, how I write, but he's saying, you recognize my signature, okay? This is the way I write. So that's who Tertius was. He was a believer, and he also sends his greetings. Gaius, who was Paul's host at Corinth, who also hosted the church in his house, um, he sends his greetings. Paul mentions him in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 14 and 15, when he's writing back to Corinth, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say, you were baptized in my name. So Paul baptized Gaius. He was one of his converts. By the way, let's not miss the fact here that uh, if you ever want a verse that shows that we are not saved through baptism, this is a very good verse because Paul could never have said this. I thank God that I baptized none of you <laughs> except Crispus and Gaius. You see, if salvation came through baptism, Paul could never say that. He would say, I thank God that I baptized all of you because the more the merrier. The more you get baptized, the more who are saved. Now, baptism is important. We need to be baptized to obey the Lord. It's His mark of His covenant on us. But we are not saved through baptism. It is not necessary for salvation. And then we see Erastus, who is the city treasurer. What city? City of Corinth. That's where this letter is being written from. Now, this is interesting because it shows us that the early Christians not only could hold office, but they actually did serve in the secular government. Okay? So here, here's the grounds for us being able to serve today, if the Lord should call us to do that, in the government that we have. Okay? If it's okay to serve under Rome... And under Babylon, let's not forget that Daniel, a very faithful Jew, served as one of the king's high officials in, in Babylon, then it's okay for us to serve in the U.S. government as long as we do not compromise God's truth. And if you're going to serve in the government, you need to realize that there may be many temptations to do that, but you have to be able to stand firm, even as we do as Christians, under this government. Okay? And then finally, Cordus, of whom we know nothing apart from the fact that he sends his greetings to the church at Rome. Now, what we need to notice from this <clears throat> first section is the affection that the early Christians had for each other. You know, they, they had the sense not only that they were working together to fulfill the same mission, you know, the Great Commission, to extend Christ's kingdom through the gospel, but they also realized that they were members of, of the same family. I mean, they, they actually loved and cared about each other. Have, have you ever found yourself talking to somebody you know and, and knowing somebody else that, that they know who's not there at the time, and you say, would you say or send my greetings to so-and-so, you know, uh, when you see them, you know? Because you, you care about that person, because, you know, that person's in your heart and in your affections, and you want them to know that you're thinking about them and that you care about them too. Well, that's what they were doing. And, and this is really what Jesus wants for all of us, that we care about each other in this way. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in the upper room, this is my commandment, that you love one another. Now, I think we understand that much of it, but, but think about what he says to complete that sentence. Just as I have loved you. Okay, that's how Jesus wants us to love each other, and that is a very high calling. So even though they weren't a part of the same church, I mean, in a certain sense they weren't because Paul was writing from Corinth and he was writing to the church at Rome and 
these greetings are being exchanged between the two churches, they recognized that they were really all part of the same church, weren't they? Because there's really only one church. That's the church of Jesus Christ. And there are local expressions. But everyone who is trusting in him is a part of one church. The invisible church, we call it, you know, because only God can see it. We can't see it. But that invisible church is made up of many visible churches of those professing the true faith. But again, the genuine believers were all part of the same church, all part of the same family. And so our Lord calls us to have the same heart towards each other, regardless of what denomination we might be a part in, if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to have that heart toward each other here, and we need to have that heart towards our brothers and sisters in other churches. So I think that is probably the main point we need to see from those greetings. But let's move on now to his doxology. Let me read it again, verses 25 through 27. Now to him, and that is, of course, to God, who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is revealed, is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Okay, Paul wants to remind his readers to whom they should give their thanks for all these wonderful things. Now, doxology. Okay, doxology is something we talk about a lot, but I just wanted to explain this word. Uh, doxa is basically the Greek word for glory. And you probably recognize, you know, the study of anything, you know, is, is called ology, right? You know, like biology and so forth. Well, doxology is not so much the study of praise, but the word from which we get that suffix, okay, is logos. And logos means word. And what this means when you put it together means speaking of a word of praise, okay, the giving of honor and glory to God. And that's really what Paul is doing here, giving the Lord all the credit for his gracious salvation because he is the only reason that we are looking forward to the blessings that Paul has referred to here rather than the eternal punishments that he has also mentioned. Paul says God alone is the one who has the power. He is able to establish us, to strengthen us, to confirm us in the gospel. That's what he has done through the gospel. And let, let's remember the gospel is not just a story. It's not just a message. It is something that has been done by the Son of God himself. Okay? It, is, it is the account of what Jesus has done to save sinners. Through the gospel, God has made us to stand. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that we will be able to stand in this life against everything that's going to come against us that would ever take us away from him. And that would include the attacks of the enemy, which we've already seen. The persecutions that, that we're going to have to face in this world. Remember what Paul says, if you live godly, in Christ, you will be persecuted. Okay, so all Christians are going to be persecuted. And the more you are like Christ, the more that's going to happen. And you will stand firm against the temptation and the sin within that would destroy us. God will give us the strength. He has given us the strength and he will continue to do so, so that we might overcome all of these things. So much so that Paul said in Romans chapter 8 that there is nothing in heaven or earth that could ever possibly separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. This means we will also stand in the day of judgment. Okay? Remember what Jude said in our meditation? And really, we need to soak this in because I think this, um, I want to say, puts to rest the question on the day of judgment. I don't know if you ever asked yourself this question. I mean, you surely have as you've read through. Because Jesus says, in the day of judgment, everything that we have ever said, 
Okay, now he's, he's saying this generally. Every idle word, every thought, every action is going to be brought into judgment, okay? Now, does he mean believers as well as unbelievers? Because that would be rather, um, you know, not, not a pleasant thought. If all of your sins on the day of judgment were going to be paraded on judgment day, well, I think Jesus was referring only to the unbelievers. That's true of them. Every sin that they have committed is going to be brought up, weighed against them, and they will be punished accordingly. But it's not true of believers. Because listen again to what Jude says and why he gives praise and glory to God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, you know, he's able to confirm you or strengthen you, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, and here's the key word, blameless with great joy. Now, if all your sins were paraded, that's hardly blameless. That wouldn't be a very joyful thing to go through that. <clears throat> It'd be very embarrassing, very shameful. But the Lord has taken our shame away. He has cleansed us of all those sins. They will not be brought up or remembered against us. The only thing that will be judged for us on that day are the things we have done for the Lord, the, the, the service that we have rendered to Him as we give an account of our stewardship. So, in the presence of His glory with, with great joy, now to Him, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. What's the proper response for the Lord's mercy in taking away all that shame and guilt and clothing us with righteousness and rewarding us for the things that we have done? It is giving glory to Him. So God is, is the reason behind all of this. He is the reason why we have hope. He's the reason why we know that everything in our lives is going to work together for good. This is why He is why we won't be lost and why we will be with Him forever in glory. It's because of His free grace in Christ alone, according to the gospel. That's what the gospel is all about. That's why God sent His Son into the world, why Jesus willingly took the role of a servant and took our place and submitted to His Father and kept His law, why He went to the cross to suffer and to die, not for any guilt, any crimes He had committed, but for all the sins that we had committed. It's because God so loved us that He was willing to do what was necessary to save us and the only way he could was by giving that which was most precious to him in our place to secure our future. Now, <clears throat> Paul says this was a mystery, okay, a mystery. One God had kept secret for long ages past, but now has revealed in the gospel. By the way, I, I did a search on this to try to figure out how many mysteries there are in the Bible. And it's kind of hard to sort them out because there are some mysterious things in the New Testament but there were mysteries in the Old Testament that were revealed in the New, and I found two main things, okay? Um, and by the way, when, when we say that they were mysteries, it doesn't mean that God didn't say anything about them, but it's just that they were not fully revealed, okay? And they didn't see the extent of it and the glory of it as we see it now. Now, Jesus spoke of one of these mysteries in His <clears throat> kingdom parables, he said to his disciples in Mark 4, 11 through 12, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables so that while seeing, they, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. You know how you've heard probably many times that Jesus spoke in parables to make his truth understandable? He actually spoke in parables to hide it from those that didn't deserve to have it. But so when after Jesus spoke these things, he would take his disciples aside and he would explain them. But what he's referring to here, I believe, is the fact that God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom and not a physical kingdom, that it's all about a change of heart. It's all about a new nature. It's not a matter of parentage, that you were the physical children of Abraham, as the Jews thought but rather that you are a spiritual seed of Abraham through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This kingdom is spiritual, and those who enter it must enter it 
through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's much more that could be said about it. God said in the Old Testament that He would circumcise their hearts, that He would give them a heart of flesh and take away their heart of stone. And they understood something of what this meant. It would change my behavior. I would begin to obey the Lord, and that's very important. But I don't think they understood that what God meant was that Jesus was going to give them, the Messiah was going to give them His Spirit, and by His Spirit dwell in their hearts. That's, that's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. The King is in our hearts by faith. He lives within us by His Holy Spirit. Now, that's one big mystery. The second one, I think, is the one that Paul is dealing with here, which is related. And that is that he was intending to, to do this for the Gentiles, okay? It wasn't, you know, the mystery was not that the Gentiles would be saved. There are several places in the Old Testament where God revealed that to, you know, to his people as a part of his plan. Remember what he said to Abraham? In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obeyed my voice. Now, they didn't understand necessarily what that meant. They thought perhaps <clears throat> Abraham's seed was them, and through the race of the Jews, the, the world's going to be blessed. As God blesses them, it's going to pour over onto the Gentiles, okay, because they saw themselves as being the first. But no, it, it meant much more than that, okay? It meant that the Gentiles would be engrafted into God's covenant. They would be included in that tree, the tree that represents the, the covenant God made with Abraham, and that they would be included as full members of his family, equal with the Jews in status, without having to become Jews. Okay, this is what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6. By revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. What is that mystery? To be specific, he says, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Okay, we have the same footing that the Jews have, even though the Jews were first and we came in later, you know, we're that son that later repented and came into the, into the vineyard, you know, so to speak, that um, perhaps the prodigal son, you know, some say that, I think Sinclair Ferguson, that that parable really has to do with the Gentile salvation. We're the Johnny-come-latelys. We're the ones that come into the vineyard later in, in the day, and we receive the same thing as those that came in earlier, Right? Well, that's something the Jews didn't, didn't like, and they did not understand it. But now it has been revealed. This is the mystery, I think, that he is referring to, the one that Peter first began to understand when he preached the gospel to Cornelius and his family, and the Spirit fell on them, and he knew they were saved. Okay, God is the one who has done this. By the way, I, I, I think I've already said this, but I believe this is the mystery Paul's referring to because the church that he is writing to is primarily Gentile, and he has spoken of this mystery in his epistle. Okay? God has done this for them through his Son. God has done this for us through his Son. And so Paul is saying we should give him all the glory, all the worship, and all the praise. He closes by saying, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Now, let me just close by saying this, that the reason why the Lord saved us, the reason why He calls us to meet together each week, I call is perhaps, you know, I hope we understand what the word call means, commands us, okay? The reason that He's going to take us to heaven and bring us into the new heavens and the new earth is that we might give Him doxology, that we might worship Him, that we might praise Him. Okay, what does God want for all the love that He has shown us? What does He want in return? He wants us to see it, to receive it, 
and to give him the credit for it by loving him in return, to praise him and to adore him. That's the only way that we can respond. That, that doesn't pay God back, by the way, but that's the only way that we can possibly respond to everything that the Lord has done for us. And so Paul tells us that that is what we need to do. Give him praise for the infinite love that he has shown us in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we've been talking a lot about um, seeing the glory of God and how the Puritans really wanted us to focus on the love of God. And, and that certainly is one of the main ways in which God reveals his glory, that he could love us, right? But if you want to be reminded of the love of God and why you should worship God, just read the book of Romans again. And you'll see God's great love and mercy revealed to undeserving sinners such as we in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will find reasons to worship Him. Well, let's, let's bow in just a moment of prayer. And uh, as we prepare to come to the table, we're again faced with uh, a summary of everything the book of Romans talks about right here in the table, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we prepare to come, let's think about that and let this move our hearts to praise and worship.